every kid in their freshman year kind of wants to cry to mom one way or the other in October and November. Lord knows I did. It's just pretty normal. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I get it. I think we've all been there. So, the, but when, if that's a five or six hour difference, that's, it's a hard thing to manage. So I've heard that usually it's more them giving it to me. We've got an athlete that's in, you know, Julia Scholes plays, but now she's going to go to SC because she just wants a new experience. She just wants to be closer to home. It's just too far. They love hmm. it. It went great. She graduated, but eh. At this point, I'm going to pull a little tighter in. At those moments, you, we just kind of bless them and say, yeah, good luck. You know, do your path. Because one thing we know we don't want is someone who doesn't, not going to want to be here. And if you get homesick enough, that starts to add up. And that's not good for me because now it's just more to manage for everyone when athletes are just uncomfortable at that level, at that kind of survival level. My name is Mark Burrick, and here on this podcast, we talk about everything and anything that helps you as a player or a coach get better at beach volleyball. We have camps, clinics, classes, online courses, online training programs, a vertical max program. So anything that you are looking for as far as tools that will help you in your game, we've got it. And lucky for you, we get interviews with really cool, high level people like we have today. So I do want to introduce the person on the screen next to me, if you're watching this or, you know, behind the speakers, if you're listening to the podcast, but this is the university of Hawaii interim head coach, Evan Silverstein, Evan, welcome, buddy. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate uh, having me on. I'm excited to uh, have a good conversation that help people get better at beach. Hell yeah. I want to know as far as an NCAA coach of a, you know, a prestigious program what was your day like today and what date is today today is june 8th what was your day like today june 8th i mean it's summer so we're in a different mode definitely preparation for recruiting we got the big recruiting deadline comes up or kind of like timeline on june 15th we move over um and open up for recruits in the 2024 class and so continuing to make preparation communication with talking to different people uh, getting my own kind of focus ready for a trip next week finalizing some travel for next week going to be in california i'm excited about that um come see some great up-and-coming athletes other than that i uh, got up and bounced on the trampoline a little bit had myself a smoothie uh, I take my little e-bike down the Very side. Tony of Robbins of you. I like it. <laughs> yeah, so I got uh, totally, I got my, my rebounder is the way to go. And uh, I got a little electric bike. So I, I have a really beautiful commute for those that know Manoa Valley kind of sits over, you know, it's like above Waikiki. It's a beautiful kind of place mm-hmm. on the island here on Oahu. So I, I ride a little electric bike down. It's about seven minute commute, real easy from our home on the stream down to the courts and had some support uh just last week brought some sand in we got new sand for the course so that was exciting had someone out there kind of smoothing it out adding sand we we got a lot of wind in the valley so we've lost a lot so just a quick little monitor on the courts excited to kind of see the sand getting smoothed out and kind of spread out and kind of adding that piece and then uh into the office for incoming 2022 just as an international student athlete so we're kind of getting her stuff proved and ready um, to do that. So working with the administration, um, some of our okay. academic services for a late ad there, hmm. and then hopped on a call with Kathy DeBeer from the ABCA Oh yeah, and all the other coaches um, from D1 coaches. We're talking about a lot of the, what the transformation committee has got going on. Their NCAA is changing the rules. Change of the rules in terms of NCAA for all athletes or just beach volleyball? What's going on there? It's everything right now. So it's called the transformation community and everyone's like, the NCAA moves really slow. In this case, they're moving really fast. They, you know, you may have heard our folks, you know, out there listening may have heard that there was a big change to the constitution in the last year. Obviously everyone's kind of getting used to the name, image, and likeness, the NIL stuff. So that's a really big groundswell change and then the constitution. before we uh before we sprint through that could you could you just unpack that and and talk about what what it means now to be a, a division one athlete in terms of what it used to be with name image likeness and and what the rules are now yeah that's kind of the watershed change is the nil and it allows athletes to benefit from their name image and likeness and each institution and each state kind of has its own way of doing that right now. Mm-hmm. So 
it's a little bit of a wild west situation relative to you might hear about a quarterback that went to Ohio state and he's making a million bucks. So it's, it's kind of the bigger sports or the ones that are there, but you're also, so yeah, big changes at the NCAA. And what we're discussing today is uh, not so much name, image and likeness, which is a change that came in that allowed athletes to benefit so they can get sponsor deals um, essentially. So athletes can get sponsored similar to the way a beach volleyball athlete might do that in the past and pick up with, you know, Wilson or Rockstar or whatever you can have uh, NCAA athletes doing similar things now where they can get paid on packages, you know, for advertising and purposes. So, which is pretty neat for them. Uh, something I think generally for me and a lot of coaches are in favor of, but it's how do we get into what the right structure of the rules are? Because you've got scenarios where all the offensive linemen are getting paid. That was what Saban and just got into with Texas A&M. They were mm -hmm. kind of complaining back and forth about that kind of stuff. So, you know, most of it is kind of higher level to the football, but it's definitely filtering down to all the sports. And, and with that, the NCAA is making other changes on the deck right now for all sports are things like roster limits, coaches counts, scholarship limits. Those things are absolutely critical to kind of figure out for equity in sports. So if they said there's no more scholarships limits, you can have, 12 or you can and beach you have only six wait you might, have, you might have 12 at you know lsu you might have two at another school that's going to be up to you they haven't said it yet but that's what's in the discussion right no now. way oh, yes. okay it's on the table it's not it's it hasn't changed yet yeah. it's a big deal um, that is so a huge deal that's like salary cap in pro sports and if you have a wealthy institution or tremendous support from boosters boosters you just take everybody and now that er and athletes can get paid it's huh the floodgates are opening yeah this is this that sounds like wild west I, you said you're kind of in favor of it favor of nil you... for sure but this stuff we're, we're trying to get positions that's what kathy's got us on the call for today is to okay. really try and craft positions and figure out where we stand as a coach association yeah you know i've always found it brutal for scholarship athletes like who all right, so I, I have a YouTube channel, right? I don't really make anything off the YouTube channel, but now it's starting to lead people to our camps and things. But I see kids who are just on a YouTube channel and they're making good money and they've got a huge following and they used to have to be limited. You know, they couldn't actually make money. Um, you see beach volleyball indoor players, sorry, indoor players go and win a tournament and get 200 bucks for winning a tournament. And they couldn't earn that, even though the NCAA treated it as a different sport. So I always found the NCAA to be a little bit unfair in some ways, but I don't know if I love just, like you said, Wild Wild West. Like, yeah, go ahead, make anything, pay anybody for any reason. I want, I, if a kid who is majoring in English in college, he gets a scholarship for how smart he was, you know, and, and how he performed, and he goes and he writes for a newspaper when he's 18 as an adult, if he can get paid, it seems that if athlete is your thing, that maybe you should be able to get paid for that. And then I know the argument comes back with, well, they are getting paid. They're getting paid a free education and everything like that. But if you're putting out that extra effort and creating something that, that people want, you should be able to earn. I don't know about getting gifted stuff or sponsorships. Man, this it's such a complicated conversation. Yeah. It is. And I, I think you're on point about athletes being able to get paid. And what you've seen in maybe since when, you know, I was in college or when you were in college uh, over the generations, NCAA has made some changes. What we're doing now is really wholesale with the stuff and the roster sizes and the scholarship. Those are really, they haven't done those changes yet, but they will be really groundswell when they happen. What they did do a few years ago is allow athletes to get uh, reasonable, I think it's called reasonable and necessary expenses. So that would allow athletes, and then they spread that over the year. In the beginning, they could get reasonable and necessary expenses, but it was a per tournament. So if Katie Spieler, one of our great Hawaii players, went to go play at a North Seca and she made a thousand bucks at that tournament, if it cost a thousand to go there for the flight mm -hmm. and the hotel, then she could get that. Then they went a little bit further. Then you start looking into the Sarah Hughes and the, the Tina Graudinas, what they do in a whole summer. 
they can kind of balance against. So if yep. Sarah Hughes and Kelly Clays go to New York City like they did when they were in college and make a semifinal and it's 10 grand or something like that, they can balance that off for all of their training that they're doing with you at the beach. It cost them in New York. They went to dinner. So there's a way to kind of like do like the almost like a tax write off kind mm -hmm. of similar kind of way to go about things. You got to keep it, you know, your physio, your equipment or your travel. So they, they can get that money now, whereas maybe when you did you, five or 10 years ago that was less available they opened right. it up a little bit then they opened it up a little bit more now they added name image and likeness that if uh you know whatever if somebody's in sponsors in college and she gets a sponsorship with nike when she was in school or something she can go ahead and make that money there so that they're opening that framework up college is becoming a lot more like pro sports right now the mm -hmm. big the big issue that we're looking at and the question for everyone right now is how do we maintain equity how do mm -hmm. we keep it fair because if you got big boosters and big resources and, and you know and one school doesn't is that going to kind of create an uh, a non-level playing field so that's what we're all working to figure out right now is any is any playing field level i mean <laughs> you know it, you, you look at it, you, you travel to a school okay it, it does a team in colorado or denver or salt lake city are they playing on an equal playing field when their air is thinner and the ball travels further in uh bigger schools big name schools like yours and usc are you really playing on an equal playing field when you have that name that has been created and and you have millions of applicants instead of thousands? You know, I don't know if there's in life really ever a level playing field. I, I think it always comes down to who can adjust to any playing field better. But in terms of college sports, yeah, it's going to, a difference in scholarships is going to be a monster difference and people can just gobble up all the best players. Yeah, we're, we're hopeful, to, I think, toward that. I think that was kind of a unanimous thing. You know, a lot a lot of great coaches, you know, colleagues, you know, Dane and Brooke, John, a lot of guys are, you know, women are in on the call today. And I, I think no one's really kind of in favor of, of lifting that. But this is this is something the NCAA is looking at for all sports. Okay. So we're, we're just kind of the beach volleyball angle. What if we do change it? How might you want to have it become? Do you want to become more of a – of an equivalency sport like that we are, or like a head count sport like indoor. Indoor's got 12 scholarships, they're full scholarships. So mm -hmm. um, they can kind of give them out one by one, whereas Beach has got six scholarships and we give out, you know, 20% here, 80% there, maybe academics there, maybe that's a legacy kid and family's paying the money. It's a range of stuff. So uh, no, I don't think anybody really wants to kind of like pull it off all together, but it, it, okay. it's out of our control. So I, I think the point you made is a really good one is how can we be adaptable? You know, and I think at UH, that's really what we're talking about with our administration is we're not going to be the ones that sets the tenor of the rule changes. Mm -hmm. how, can we, how can we be ready to take best advantage of whatever rule changes come in? How can we adapt? Uh, and that's, that's always going to be a key to uh, competitive success. And how good of a mindset is that to have in, you know, not just sports, not just NCAA, but y your whole life? Like nothing's ever going to be completely fair. So everybody just needs to stop thinking that in any way life is not going to come at you in any sort of fair way so playing victim and saying like oh well i didn't get well i didn't get you know it's who can who can just decide to move a mountain when it's in your way <laughs> so that's yeah. people who pivoted we were one of the kind of beneficiaries like pivoting during COVID into how do we now adjust there people had brick and mortars and a lot of them you know went down some people learned how to pivot to a completely, not even like a different playing field, a completely different one. You know, so I, th I think as seeing you in a, in a head coach position right now, it's like, oh, that's, that's clear why you should be there. Because when you embrace the mentality of, yeah, it's not going to be fair, but how are we going to be ready to adapt? That is such a huge mindset thing in, instead of looking at the field and being like, well, we don't do well on that. It's no, how do we adapt to that? Yeah, then you don't, then you're not on the field for very long like that, <laughs> with a perspective like that. So yeah, we have pride in our history of success. I think in volleyball in Hawaii, we have such a great legacy of volleyball at UH and then just in Hawaii, you know, obviously the legacy of ADP players on the men's side speaks for itself. We have US Olympic players. Um, there's something in the water or is there something in our culture? And I think a lot of it is that people really care about volleyball here. People really Why? know a lot about volleyball. Yeah. It's, it's clear. Like you guys sell out every indoor match. It's insane. I think you guys hold the records for, for sold out matches every year. But why is, or is Hawaii so volleyball thirsty? Why does the entire island show up to a UH match? 
could you define it? Could you point yeah. to a person or a year where yeah. Hawaii just said, we are now a volleyball state? There's a few things that go into this is a long and a fun story. So we can kind of like jump in at different angles, you know, and we're good at it so that everyone likes a winner. Um, and particularly in Hawaii, we don't have professional athletics. So, mm -hmm. you know, our college teams really take on like a heightened importance um, okay. in the community. Similar to you might see for Nebraska, you know, for indoor volleyball, which also does a great job with attendance and hosting and things like that. So, um, you know, so part of it is what we don't have that helps to highlight what we do have. Then there's things like our history. I think Kevin Wong and some of those guys have done a nice job highlighting what George Dad Center. There's, it's said that beach volleyball was originated here in Hawaii, right? So right. we started like, so Duke and all of his group, Duke swim coach is great Duke movie Kurt, right now. Kamana, Kamana. Um, Duke Adamoku. Um, Thank you. So there, there's, an, <laughs> there's an amazing movie. Actually, I'll make a plug for, for Duke. Uh, it's called Waterman. That's out on PBS right now. So if anyone's out there and you want to keep a good look, learn a little bit about Hawaii history. And Duke was actually a beach volleyball player. Not a lot of people knew that. He was an Olympic swimmer. He's a lifesaver. He also, when the swells were down, what did they do? They strung up the net and they played a little beach volley. So I always kind of link that to, if you look back at the, the my understanding, and you guys can fact check me, is that the longest running beach volleyball tournament is the six man. Okay. Right. And the six man is called what? The surf festival. It's called the surf festival. And what does everyone do? They dress up. Well, what does everyone like to do in Hawaii? We win Halloween also. Everybody dresses <laughs> up and everybody surfs. So if you link back Duke coming over into Santa Monica in the 30s and 40s, then this tournament kind of starts up. Everyone's having kind of a fun game. And obviously the game evolves in Southern California. There's no doubt about that. The evolution of the game that happens in SoCal is amazing. But we do have this long kind of affinity for um, beach volleyball all the way back to its beginnings. For volleyball generally, you know, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I can't pin it to one thing. I know from a Title IX perspective is another way to look at it. We've had some really, you know, power. we're in the 50th anniversary of Title IX. I'll put wow. another plug there. Wow. June, June 23rd, I believe, will be, or coming up this month is the 50th anniversary. Now, the woman who signed it, who was kind of the co-sponsor of it is Patsy Mink. She's graduated the law school where I actually went to here at UH as well. Mm. So there, she was a congresswoman from UH or from Hawaii that had a lot to do with sort of pushing that law through. And our AD at the time, or sort of our women's administrator at the time, was a woman named Donna Thompson. So they did a lot of cool stuff into the 70s when Shoji came on. Dave coached here 42 years. And with tremendous success, second most winningest all-time coach other than Russ Rose um, over at Penn State. So he did it for 42 years, but it's cool stories about how he starts, you know. So there, there's a really neat beginning to it all. And Donis with Patsy and Dave and others kind of, they, they pushed away to say, we're going to get the Blaisdell to host a volleyball game. We went to, you know, nationals and everyone loved us. So we're going to host the game. And they're like, you're crazy. It's never going to work. Or we're going to sell tickets. You're going to sell tickets for women's volleyball in Hawaii. You're crazy. And it worked. She went around. She does all this work. She gets out there. She gets people to support it. And ever since that moment really was the, before there was the Stan Sheriff Center where we play volleyball now and all those sellouts you're talking about. There was the Blaisdell and the whole community came together to support um, the women's volleyball team. And so really from that moment on, I think it really becomes sort of a splash into the Hawaiian community where people say, wow, this is the coolest thing that we got volleyball. And then, then kids see it on TV, they go to the games and it just keeps building up. We got the life and the lifestyle, obviously families that have played for a long time, the crab Ohana, you know, Tony mm -hmm. Crab and Chris Crab, and they're teaching their kids. And there's outrigger and the huge history there. The Haynes, there's, you know, Tom Hain on the 68 Olympic team. We call him daddy, like his kids and all their kids. So it, there's just been, I think, historical figures that have done a tremendous job. And then um, just a couple a little bit, like you said, pivoting, you know, mm -hmm. kind of making right moments at right times really to kind of create an explosion. And uh, here we are with volleyball just at its, you know, Charlie Wade men's volleyball team has won our national championship. So we're, we're continuing that record of success. Robin Amo um, is amazing to work side by side with on the indoor program. They do, they just, they, they just know how to represent. So it's, it's fun to be a part of all that and just try and do our little, create our beach volleyball path and our beach volleyball history kind of in the middle of all that. You know, I've got a question for you that I think of as you're talking about all that. Do you find it as a coach, do you find it easy to 
recruit to Hawaii, do you think like you have an upper hand in the level playing field of recruiting or is it more difficult because you're so far away from everybody? Yeah. What's the balance? Great history, paradise, great school with a great name, a brand name, but also it's a light. I imagine a lot of players you just lose because like my parents don't want me to go that far. You know, you're on point. We say that uh, geography is our greatest challenge and our biggest asset. It, it's just that's across the department. I think for beach volleyball, we get a little more pull because it's beach volleyball and the types of athletes that are interested in wanting to go to the beach might be the same ones that want to go surfing or go hiking. So mm. maybe different than you might see in basketball, you know, just a different style of athlete that the beach gets to draw. So yeah, it's, it's our greatest asset and it's our greatest challenge. We always tell folks it's not going to change. <laughs> um, it's 2,500 miles in five hours. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways that we mitigate. We go to California a lot to compete so kids can see their families in those moments. Yeah, but we need a certain style of athlete, a certain style of student athlete that's going to be here that's willing to deal with being away from home from mom and dad and not you assess that through. in the interviews and in the emails and the phone calls. Do you get a feel for like, yeah, they say they want to come, but you know, they're still really pulled to, to being with their family. And you're just like, you know what? Hey, we love you. But I can tell in a, in about three months, you're going to be, I'm not going to say crying home to mama, but <laughs> you know, but you want to be with your family. You don't want to be so far outside your comfort zone. Like for me, my oldest brother from New York city, right? We're from Queens. He went to university of Nebraska because his guidance counselor said, Hey, you like football, right? Well, Nebraska has got a great football team. And my brother said, Okay. He, he was miserable. He went there for a semester and he was like, we literally hung out under a street light on this one street and that was Friday and Saturday nights. So do you try to pick up on that before an athlete gets to you? And have you ever just said like, let's, let's part ways here. Cause it might not work out in the future. Yeah. You know, we definitely assess for that. We, you know, we check in and ask questions whether they've ever been to Hawaii, you know, sometimes they've never been here. So that's, its own thing, right? You've been on the island before, your family lives over here, you've kind of gotten a little taste of it. So whether they've been here, do they have any connection to it? They have a family member that's that lived here for the military or a sister who played on the softball team or whatever. Some sense of like kind of a little tie-in or buy-in. And you certainly they certainly don't need that to be successful, but those are usually helpful clues. You know, with when we get outside of California further away from the West, there's a little more education there because sometimes they don't realize how quite how far it is. Like, oh, I didn't know it wasn't just like Catalina. <laughs> you know, like it, it's out there. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that. So yeah, we're constantly assessing for that. And I, I mean, I've had my heart broken when an athlete, you know, when it's down to us and, you know, a UCLA with a kid from Texas and us and whatever, us and, you know, with a girl from Canada, us and Stanford. It's just, you know, I just... Oh, the time zone difference. I can't talk to mom because it's going to be really far away. Like you said, they're crying to mom. Every kid in their freshman year kind of wants to cry to mom one way or the other in October. And Lord knows I did. It's just pretty normal. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I get it. I think we've all been there. So, the, but when if that's a five or six hour difference, that's, it's a hard thing to manage. So I've heard that usually it's more them giving it to me. We've got an athlete that's in, you know, Julia Scholes plays, but now she's going to go to SC because she just wants a new experience. She just wants to be closer to home. It's just too far. They love mm. it. Went great. She graduated. But eh, at this point, I'm going to pull a little tighter in. At those moments, you, we just kind of bless them and say, yeah, good luck. You know, do your path. Because one thing we know we don't want is someone who doesn't, not going to want to be here. And if you get homesick, enough that starts to add up and that's not good for me because now it's just more to manage for everyone when athletes are just uncomfortable at that level at that kind of survival level can you dive in specifically to i mean you don't have to name names or anything but specifically to somebody who really feels sick of being there but they don't know why they want to be there and they're trying to leave you know, like in relationships, like sometimes you have this like kind of breakup, you have this separation, but people still fight to be together, even through the discomfort. And that happens all the time on teams of people trying to separate, looking elsewhere. What's that fight like for you as a coach? And I'm not going to say how hard, but maybe you can just describe how you fight to keep an athlete here and how long you fight to do that. Do you have any... Uh, 
could you riff on that? Yeah, I mean that's that's it's a critical question. I'd say every year there's you know one or two, especially we're in the transfer portal era. It's different. You know, when you were in college, you you, know, you had to kind of suck it up or sit a year out, and those kinds of scenarios are over now. Athletes can opt out in the middle of a semester and join the team the next semester somewhere else. So we're we're sensitive to that. You know, we won't be too sensitive because they don't want to be hostage to what athletes' whims and changes will be. Bye. I'm out of here. Okay. See you. Know, ya. No problem. The main thing is culture. You know, if we have a culture that athletes are being supported, we, I have an open line of communication. My door is open. They feel like they can text me. They can call me. They can walk in the door. We can usually communicate and make it less of a less of a struggle, less of a fight, more of a conversation. And then we can get through some of the superficial tensions. And I think that's kind of the goal always as a coach is to kind of get an athlete to kind of to blue, like cool them down a little bit. So it's okay. That's that was like for today, or that was like a little thing, but we can move on when we've seen patterns or we start to see behavior that's outside of their norm. If they're, they're acting out in certain ways, practice outside practice, those get to be bigger issues. So mm. again, just more dialogue, more conversation about you know, kind of checking in on feelings and needs. Like what are the feelings and what do you need from all this? What do you, you need ease? You need comfort. You need safety. You know, what, what is it that's getting it? getting kind of to you and what are ways that we can provide that need maybe in a way that more creatively than you had thought you only used to getting that level of support from mom and maybe we can figure out ways you know it might be that they need a church you know it might be that they relationship with their teammates it could be schools really getting them down like so there's there's so many these are young developing um really amazing and talented but nonetheless still vitally emotional young women. So they are going through a lot of stuff. And so we just try and kind of unpack it, prioritize it to a certain degree. And then if there's a bigger thing where it's for sure, you know, we're going to lean out, then eventually when you can really see that clarity, then again, not wanting to struggle, you know, it's like, can we, you know, it's going to be, we kind of set a date. Okay. I'm going to go on the portal for the end of the year. So then Mm. now it's kind of a crisis, man, not the crisis is over, but we're now we're in sort of a, not a conflict management, but an athlete's, you know, they're going to leave at the end of the year. <laughs> so yeah. then you got to coach them and for what you got them for, you know, and especially again, yeah, and they might COVID, be against you. Yeah. I, I think for the, mo- I feel grateful for the most part um, with our staff here and in my years kind of at the helm, I, I don't think people are leaving because of us, you know, that it's again, it's a geography primarily. Sometimes the academics might be a team thing so that every school is dealing with the portal these days, both in and out. Um, So it's just a new era of being sensitive to athletes, having good conversations with athletes. Mental health is kind of the buzz in the NCAA right now. So really investing on athlete mental health, getting them resources, getting them tools so that they can help themselves and so that they feel like the team is a safe place for them to get that help. Those are really the big things for us. And then that the smaller level decision of when a kid's going to, when an athlete's going to go, when they're not going to go, they they kind of figure it out. And eventually once they're gone, it's not that you want them gone, but you're, you want to kind of healthily kind of help lead them gone because it, it's not great to have in your culture as someone who doesn't want to be there. So you're dealing with that kind of constantly. And I imagine that club coaches are dealing with this nonstop from parents who say, we're leaving a club, kid who's saying, we're leaving a club. So you're doing it at a, you know, we'll call it a higher playing level. But I think emotional investment, it's the exact same emotional investment as as a club director or club coach. But I still think people look up to you. So if you were to give a two-minute seminar on, hey, when players want to leave your club, your team, how do you handle it? And and if you're talking to a whole bunch of club coaches out there, do you have any like two-minute quick hitter (laughs) advice and like, do this, do this, do this. And Hey, take it easy on this. Yeah. It's a challenging question. And what I'll first say is I can empathize with the club coaches that might be out there listening because they're dealing a lot more with parents. Hmm. The good and lucky thing about our situation is we deal with parents to a degree as we're recruiting, but for the most part, once we get an athlete in, it's, it's their responsibility. So it's a neat opportunity to kind of develop those athletes to make have those adult decisions and just adult conversations. Parents 
tend to be very emotional and they see their athletes, their, you know, their children in, you know, through kind of a rose lens, understandably so. <laughs> so You're very good at saying as we laugh, <laughs> You know uh, that it's all about parent management at that level um, because the parent thinks the kids should be in or you, they paid and they should travel or they paid this and they, this, she's better than Janie. She beat Susie and Susie beat Janie. So therefore she should get that. Those kinds of things are a little harder to deal with because they're not always as rational or measured. So I think the first and best advice, which pretty much fits for everything in my coaching these days and in my life and relationships is listen, you know, give people an opportunity to be heard. And so that it could be an angry parent. It could be an athlete that's coming in and is having a challenge. Hear them out, you know, and hear them out in a way that as non-personally as you can, even if it might be personal. You know, even if it's like, oh, the coaching, you know, this is what's wrong with the staff. And then I want to, oh, no, we did this. Just take it in and listen and really hear what's real for them. What are they needing? You know, and listen in a way to really figure out what it is that they need and and start to see from there how are ways that you have a culture or that you have a program or you have something that can help them see that maybe they can get those needs met in house. Right. So you, we want, we'll always want to stay in house if we can is the first thing. So first would be listen, you know, for the specific needs. And then once, once you get a sense of what those are, um, maybe sort of, Hey, would, would you be willing to, you know, here are some ways that we could support you in getting these, you know, important needs met. It sounds like you really need to be, you need some ease, you need support, you need opportunity. That's the big one for athletes. Now I have it with athletes. Now they want to play. And if so, if they don't, then it's, you know, how can we make practice seem a certain way? How can we create green, white opportunities? How can we, you know, everyone wants to play and really mom just wants their kid to play. Yeah. In some cases, it might just be like, look, you're going to be better off at that other club because you're going to get more opportunity to play. So that might be the final result. You got to be prepared to maybe kind of walk somebody out and clubs different because those are also, you know, there's money on the line. That's how you make your livelihood. If a kid, if an athlete leaves here, I still get a salary, right? If an athlete leaves a club, I might not have dinner. So that's a very so that good point. That's a very good point. I talked to a few club directors in the past few days and they're like, I'm barely making money. And people think I pay you all this money. And these are pretty sizable clubs, you know, 40, 80, 80 kids. And they're like, no, this is my full-time thing. I just love volleyball. And I know that there's a need, you know? So like, Maybe if you're lucky, you're making a, a couple grand, but you're doing this wrong. You're always, my kid is, blah, blah. I, I just find that to be kind of nightmarish. Uh, it makes me feel very blessed to do things the way that we do it and, and work not exclusively, but work consistently with adults who we deal with one set of emails per person, not yeah. three, not, not kid, mom, and dad. Um, Parents definitely certainly uh, make things more complex. But in the cases of uh, club directors, they're also writing the checks. So it's it, it's kind of just a part of the management and all the people that I know, both indoor and beach club directors or coaches, parent management is way more, it's more like pain management. It's a little bit more of a, than they would want it to be, but it's also, again, where, where the checks are coming from. So uh, yeah, try listen um, and be really patient and uh, figure out, you know, how you can get parents you know, an athlete's needs met, you know, in-house or, you know, hopefully move them, you know, on somewhere else if you can, if you can afford it. And if they can, you know, you think there's better places that they might just have their experience. Mm. And there's something that, you know, I, I feel like so many club directors might want is to set the rule that says we don't have to listen. Like you signed up to play this club. Here's the piece of paper that you sign that you say, I'm not going to approach the coach in X way on any of these days. Uh, we had a very, when, when I was coaching club for my 15th team in Brooklyn, I said, you will not talk to me the day after a match, like for the full 24 hours after a match, there's no text to me that I will answer. There's no phone calls that I will answer. And if you want to talk about the match or playing time or anything like that, everything will wait 24 hours. And if they came to me, I said, Hey, we have a 24 hour rule. Sorry. Because for me, I'm invested as a coach, right? So if if we just lost, I'm definitely going to be upset. I'm going to be pissed. So I know that I'm more likely to get fired up if they come at me. And for sure, them and their kids are the most upset during that time. So that 24-hour window, I think I, I, I was lucky enough with club to have a, a bunch of great parents and great kids. But that didn't stop 
all of those questions and conversations. And I never had to have that forced rule, but I bet so many club directors just want to look at it and say, hard, hard rule. Like these are the rules. If you don't like them, if you don't like playing time, no, there is no conversation. You get a like one or two strike policy and then you just fire a parent. And I know that more parents should be fired. <laughs> yeah, you, it's, you have to chop that block at some point. If it's always costing you time, energy and making you miserable, like some parents need to be fired as parents and say, here, here's all your money back for the whole season. Goodbye. Well, you know, I, I guess as you're talking, a couple of things come to mind here. One is I like what you did in your 15s team is you made an agreement. You know, it's a rule, but it's maybe even framing as these are agreements. You know, I'm going to, you have to sign it. And by signing this, you're agreeing to give yourself this cool down period. The cool down period is going to benefit you and it's going to benefit me. So you give them a little education with the agreement so then they can relax into that, I think is, you know, is a big, big step to kind of move into. And it sounds like you're able to use that. And that's a good insight, you know, I think maybe for other clubs to kind of figure out ways to kind of get that gun. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I feel grateful. Um, I coach at Outrigger, the canoe club, but it's, I get to stay out of some of the, doing a little more parent management these days. Just done some changes, but overall, um, just a little bit of club work here that we're allowed to do in the NCAA. But I have a lot of empathy and uh, understanding for how challenging it is for club coaches to, to make it work um, with different parents and, you know, different situations. So good luck with it, guys. <laughs> good luck. It should be so enjoyable. It's, it, I think it's just, it's a shame that we, the volleyball community, and I am, you know what, this is going to be all sports, so it's not volleyball, but we're losing tremendous coaches because they get so unhappy because of that situation. You know, the, the more pressure people put on those coaches and directors, you're going to remove what you might think is a bad coach or a bad director, but is really a passionate director who's it's not doing it your way. And it, and it stinks that we might be losing some of those personalities each year that could have done great things for sports and kids and people want to have everybody have some peace and yeah conversation. The education yeah. helps too. That, that was the other point that I was thinking of is education, right? So you can, because when you're in a club scenario for us, you know, in a college level, our culture, the education happens mostly with the student athletes right around what the culture is. But if you're going to be a club and you got to recognize that the parents are kind of part of that, they mm -hmm. are really part of the clubs because A, they fund it. B, they're helping to travel the athletes. They're helping to feed the athletes. They're doing different things. So how do we figure out ways to get them to contribute, but also agree to different rules and educate them along the way? So maybe that, that's something I think bigger clubs probably have an easier time with this because they have more time and they have more teams, you know, to do parent education seminars, you know, give them a positive coaching kind of thing. When the kid gets in your, in your car at the end of the day, it, you know, the main thing I let them know is that you love them and that you support them. Not that their cut shot didn't work. You don't need God. a 14 year old coming off the beach in Manhattan beach and having dad after they just trained with Patty and Mike, tell them how to hit a cut shot. Dad wasn't the pro. Patty and Mike are the pros. Patty and Mike are going to show them how to do it. And they're going to do it really positively with a thousand different positive encouragements. Yep. Last thing I need is mom and dad to kind of go ahead and give them the, I gotta not do it that way. Kid don't want to hear it. That's yep. the message, parents. Kids don't want to hear that. They want. To I know had a stern but talk with my dad in college. Yeah. Um, my, like in college, he never got too involved. But I couldn't stand when outside people who were not in the practice field uh, were not on the bench or were not hearing what we talk about, saying you just didn't look like this X today. And my dad started talking about it, and he he really never talked much about it, but he got really passionate about volleyball when I started it. And he started talking after a loss about why we did this or that we didn't have this. And I said, dad, what you need to do right now is pat me on the fanny. <laughs> it's a tough game and be quiet. I, I will talk to you about it when I'm ready. But a lot of people don't have that. Like my dad understood where I was at. And now him, my wife, they all know, like, if I lose a match, I'm going to go kick a few garbage cans. I'm going to go through, you know, chuck some things in the air. And then in about an hour, I'll come back and I'll be ready to be a human again. But <laughs> that conversation, that window after on the ride home, that is not the time for reflection or discussion or definitely not criticism. Yeah, or it's analysis, any analysis at that point or the criticism really is, 
I think that we're finding that again, that kind of taps back into that mental health vein that we're, we're just all talking about and just scratching the surface on to realize how much pressure these athletes are under both at a club level and a college level, both those that are trying to get into college and the stress that comes there, those, and those that are even at the very pinnacle of the game, you know, we're seeing suicide. Like there's really, really big time things happening with really, really high level athletes. So I think our eyes are opening to all the different places that those stressors may be showing up. Mm-hmm. So again, education is important both, you know, for, in my case, directly to student athletes. I don't really educate parents necessarily because we're Hawaii. We, we travel a certain way when we kind of, we like to fly a bigger flag, but I know at certain, you know, at certain institutions, it's kind of locked off from parents. Parents are just blatantly not even really around the team and there's more distance. And I can see the value in that. Again, we have kind of in Hawaii, we call it Ohana. Uh, it means family. So we have a bit of a broader feeling when we travel on the road, we've got families nearby and we like to welcome them. They get to know me. They, they, I think they know their place relative to that, like kind of getting into kind of like more, you know, dialogue, but I know that they're definitely talking to their kids around things, but again, in the right time and place and when it's welcome and when it's agreed upon, those are really important things for, for athletes to maintain, you know, it's, 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 again, what do they need? They need safety. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. emotional safety for a, for a 15 or a 16 or an 18 year old athlete is everything. When they don't have it, they will not compete well. When they don't have it, they will not compete well. That part I feel pretty clear about. So how can we as parents, clubs, coaches, whatever level we're at kind of create, even though we're going to push them out of their comfort zones to really peak their level up, they still need to have a sense of trust and safety that really can guide their journey, that they're willing to risk, that they're willing to fall I'm going to put him in a hard situation. Yeah, you lost at threes, but hey, guess what? Like, I love the way that you're initiating your serve. You came in, you defended well. You started out great in the first set. We saw that dip, but something we can look at. Let's go back in and see what we got there. So we can get in and look and say, you lost the match, but 100 great things happened. That's fantastic. I pushed you a little past your level. Okay, but you, you gave everything you had, and I'm proud of that effort. Let's pull you back up, dust you off, and get you back going. Not like, oh, you finally got your opportunity at three, and you, you know, you, you gave it up, and you're never gonna get back there. Uh, that's not something. At least not in women's athletics. I, I, I haven't noticed that to be successful um, as a kind of a tactic. So I think creating the safety and the trust and the conversation on those really, really big pieces for us to be able to, you know, kind of create success. Yeah, that's the wife back there. Cool. You no. Know. Uh, <laughs> so. Talking about, you know, mental and emotional, is there an or several attributes that you define as this is what successful players have or do in terms of mentality? Yeah, that's another great question right there. And I know it's it's one that you have me prepared for, but I don't think I've <laughs> That's number three. <laughs> I think that's right on the list. And it's, I'll talk about everything else that was on the list. Yeah, you know, I, I, adaptability. We talked about it earlier. You know, beach volleyball tenacity, um, I think, is an important one. That sort of the ability to continue the rebound element. How can we move on? How can we reframe? How can we get to the next point? How can we sort of... Can you train that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely... It, part of it, it comes is definitely a character trait. It's certainly something you can train in conditioning. One thing we sometimes say, I've, I've heard it come up a lot lately, is you know how do anything is how we do everything. So we can train it in how we sweep the closet. We can train it in how we keep the team room. We can train it in how we talk to each other. We can train it in how we are on the sideline. We can train it in how we approach drills. So there's, I think there's habits. I think the power of habit really plays a bigger role in creating things like resiliency, tenacity, you know, some of those things that we, I think are commonly identified as really good beach traits, you know, at least sort of mentally, I mean, physically, you know, longer, taller, faster, stronger. Yeah. All of that and Mm -hmm. more metrics really do matter. Um, And so those are driving the the engine. But when we get into the point where we're going to get into the fine tune, the mental stuff, I think how we, that's those are cultural pieces. How do we operate as a culture? How are we doing you know, little things, because that's going to reflect in how we do bigger things. So no cutting corners, no pointing fingers, those types of things, taking self-responsibility, accountability. So broad range, no one or two things. I think resiliency, tenacity are really big ones for me when I think about beach volleyball players that have been successful. And yeah, some couple of ideas about how to train it. I don't know that I've got it. I'm still working on it. 
<laughs> yeah. Now I'm coaching, but I, I like the things that I'm uncovering. So it's fun to be kind of leaning in the direction of, of some of these, you know, great team cultures. And again, we have such a good history here and sense of purpose, something bigger. So that's mm-hmm. purpose driven, right? So when we get well, Hawaii, you want to represent Hawaii, Hawaii beach volleyball, that's a big deal. So I think sometimes that can help people lift up out of the small drama, you know, mm-hmm. the little things in Hawaii, we call it the pilikia, the weeds, <laughs> you know, the, oh, I'm not playing or how come she got this chance or, you know, those kinds of questions that come up. I think when we get connected to something bigger when we have a bigger vision for the program, a bigger vision for what we represent as an institution, you know, to the people of Hawaii or, or just kind of tapping into that, it helps some lift us up, you know, into kind of just a higher realm to focus. If you were, you talked about like bigger, taller, stronger. The first thing I, when I first started like a podcast version on YouTube, it was garbage, but I asked people like speed round questions. And one of the questions that I'm always interested is if you, if all things, all things were equal, would you choose an increase in height in an athlete? or an increase in speed and agility? Yeah, it's a hard. <laughs> I think I might have to say speed and agility, you know, is it maybe because I'm small, but I tend to like to bring in tall players, but I, I do know that we, you know, we have tall athletes that don't just make it right away. You know, mm-hmm. that you kind of need both. It's beach volleyball, it's demanding at that level where height is not the only indication. Uh, right. And you graduated you- uh, Katie Spieler, who, yeah. you know, AVP Rockstar is what, 5'5", five, 5'4"? Five, yeah. five, yeah, and, I mean, we and and Chris Cook and Brittany yeah. Teagues, you know, like so players that have high IQs, um, but you know, there's it's 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 just a it's a hard mix, you know. I, it's it's not just one one answer, but if you were just tall, <clears throat> I don't think you could play beach necessarily. I don't think the six we've seen lots of the six six kind of bird level bones that just don't <laughs> middles don't translate as well on the beach. It takes a lot of undoing sometimes for those styles of athletes to come over and be great. So I don't think height alone is an indicator, but obviously when you have the right mix of height with, you know, you look at Phil, like when Phil started, I was on the beach in 2002 in Florida, you know, watching Nick and Phil play and Phil broke the rules. You know, you played against Phil. We've all seen Phil and call him the goat now, but when he started, he's just hitting this angle and we're all like, Oh, like, what is that? What do we do? What do we do? From the Bud Light tour, watching like, hey man, like you probably want to go to California, bro. Like, somebody's gonna get you. Yeah. Um, so there's moments like that where height kind of changes the paradigm, you know. So height at that, I think Phil's height and a, you know, a, I don't know if he's speedy necessarily, but his agility and his dexterity with the height was game changing. So that's what everyone's kind of going for, right? Who can get the height with some of the attending pieces that go with it? Those become really kind of like deal breaking, sure. deal making kind of situations. And, you know, I always hear people say this like trash, like, oh, you're too tall to be fast. You're too tall to be agile. No, there's no such thing. Like the the percentage of athleticism is the same percentage in six foot people, five, five people and six, six people. It doesn't mean tall, unathletic or slower. It means that there's less of them. There's less six, nine people. So if you only have seen 10, six, nine people in your life, then nine of them are going to be terrible athletes. Just like 90% of people who are 6'3", 6'6", 5 feet are, are terrible athletes or can't play that sport, you know? There's just a lot more people that you see who are athletic, so you associate it. But I can't stand when people say like, oh, I'm too tall, not agile, like a big goon, he can't move. It has nothing to do with the height. Yeah. It, it's the same percentage. It's across all guys. <laughs> it's it's nice to have the, the luxury of having the metrics on one side, you know, again, is in the smaller court, particularly, I think mm. this is an easier question 25 years ago, because speed and agility was even that much more of a factor, because it was kind of a bigger court. So they had, it just felt like it covered more distance. But I think the FIVB is proving that these guys are huge and they just, hand, no one could ever hand set. Like, right. you, you know, you just wait for the guy to miss the call and everyone would be, you know, now everyone's just catching and chucking. So it's, it's just a different game now on the men's side, particularly. I feel grateful that I was at least played mostly in the old era and some mm-hmm. in the new era. And I'm sure happy that I'm like retired now. I mean, I like to play for fun, but I don't want to, I don't, I don't think I would have taken the game on. I don't think I would have played. I would have, I wouldn't have picked it 
I, if I had to, you know, play against the Giants from the yeah. beginning, it just wouldn't make sense. But I, I think the game now, if yeah, if I'm five eight now, personally, I don't know that I pick beach volleyball because I'm going, uh, it's just not. But in 1990. 91, 92 mm-hmm. in New York when I'm starting. I'm like, wait a second, maybe, you know, it was still right. uphill, but it was maybe. And I yeah. was like, I can make maybe into a yes. I can build that into a yes. I can have success here. And it was better than indoor because indoor, there was no coaches. Coaches are going to tell me you're too small. Beach volleyball. I was like, I'm going to beat your NYU guys. I'm going to beat your Penn yep. State guys. I'm going to beat your George Mason guys. I'm going to beat your Southampton guys, whatever. I just play them and win. I'd be like, all right, whatever. I can't go play your college, but I'll whoop your guys on the beach all day. And that happened for years. So it gave me confidence to say, okay, I can go out and play in this game as a small guy. But now I might, I don't know what I would pick. But you'd I don't still know play because you'd still love the game. And you, and you would beat the people who, who you're interested in beating. You know, there'll be some, they'll, there's always a, what do you call a pecking order? Yeah. You know, so you'd still love it. Everybody falls, still falls in love. It's just, you know, all right, I'm going to beat. You always just look at that next one person that that you want to be, and you're like, "That's the level." Yeah, made a little level jump. Yeah, keep climbing. Could you? Oh man, could you imagine Phil's offense on this court on the big court? Like just his offense. Yeah. We're not going to talk about total game defense, virtual reality. What would he do against Karch? How would they play against each other? I, I don't even want to imagine that. But just the level of his offense with the angles that he has such control of on the small court, it would be yeah, silly. it would be impressive. In reception is the one place I know that when I, again, when I played him in like, Oh, two, we could get him in serve receive, but that was an Oh, two fill. That was like pre taught, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was like Nick, just like serve me the ball, serve me the ball. And you're like, no, no, no. Barking at you. Yeah. Over here, like yep. short sideline, like jumper to the corner, like just trying to get him and you could at least get a couple, you know, in there. But yeah, I mean, you know, I think all these guys that, you know, he's just one example of, you know, the international style, the Anders and some of the Germans and the Netherlands guys are just huge. And the defenders are six five or whatever. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's coming up. But I think that proves your point that you don't need to be that the tall guys can be just as athletic, you know, as you know, as the small guys have been in the past. So um it's exciting. It's fun to watch the changes in the game, watch the Qataris, like what those guys are doing. Just watching the women, what they're doing, you know, watching, you know, Sponsel when she came through college. Clay's when she came through college, you know, the McNamara's when they came through college, each kind of with a defining element of how they're doing what they're doing. And then now if you look, I looked at a uh, world, I don't know, it was world championships or just the last tournament before that, the Latvian tournament. And like of the top 20 seeds or 21 seeds, there was easily, so it's like 40 players mm. out of 40 players. I think there was like 12 or 13, like NCA all Americans. Oh yeah. A, Cause I, is in there the max are in there bukovic is in there that's on top of the u.s girls so i'm it's so cool to be a part of the nca like women's beach volleyball like they're better than the men were 20 years ago yes. like, i know we're i've like, said this for a minute now really like true. the ncaa now that now that parents and money and ncaa scholarships are going to beach volleyball i think okay well now the ncaa is like training players from other countries and then they go back during the summer they compete for their countries but i think there's just going to be american dominance just by nature of look at what we did with our ncaa program you know this is this is a big answer for people and the level of women's volleyball has just blown up so i do have a a curiosity for when you're coaching teaching for the women's game it's way easier to get kills on too it's way easier to get a set over a bump kill onto, and this is just this is just physics. The the net's lower, so the ball doesn't have to get as far from the ground. So defenders have less time. Shots should fall better. Cut shots should fall better. Doesn't matter how high you're coming from. It matters that it's it can be low enough to cross that net. So defense is harder for women. But are you training them right now to constantly have a like peripheral eye on the other side of the net while they're setting? Or are you just saying like, hey, if it if it's open, go for it, but we're we're still playing a three touch game. Yeah, it's a hard thing in coaching because I know five years ago I was more like a guy that I was like, ah, like I just want to play up and down. I want us to be able to set great. I want yeah. my team to be able to set great so we focus That's on cheap, great. cheap volleyball. And then and yeah, <laughs> and then Katie definitely opened my eyes to that. You know, she they've got ones, they have really good ones, you know, when the blockers are running up and it goes over their head in the back, like that. It's just it's Katie would bump roll it over people and she could beat anybody with it. 
And then I watch uh, Tia Miric at Cal Poly. Like she's really good at it. She hand sets over in that same direction. Not a, it's, the back set is not as common. You know, I remember uh, a couple of them had the kind of the prayer too. They kind of like get, it's tight to the net and they just jam it back. It's good in mm -hmm. transition. You know, this one every once in a while, the back release can score. And then just two overhead. I mean, look at the way Kip plays plays. Oh my God. She's yeah. an on two ninja. Yeah. So it's definitely like, it's a stretch in coaching, but I'm doing it more. I'm coming up with drills that, you know, different peppers that are to, you know, boom, boom, boom. Like, you know, how do we do things to kind of get our hand and our thinking to go quicker? So part of it is just trying to kind of the synapse, I guess, to be able to think that quickly. Part of it is in certain shape, let them be in a setting drill. And then if you have the two, take it. You know, so you're setting to just a point, but then if you see a ball that you might want to kind of practice on your two, okay, practice two there. And then just go okay. back to the drill. So create some leniencies and what maybe were a little bit more rigidly focused drills to add to, add drills that are just purely two ball focused. When I incentivize it, we do it and we do it in practice and we get really good at it. Then if I don't, suddenly a day comes and I don't incentivize, then we're not doing it. I'm like, hey. We just incentivized all day yesterday. Mm -hmm. You guys are two ball queens. Today we're not incentivizing it. It's gone off the table. The right. purpose is so that you can integrate. You can't just be like on demand. You want to integrate. So it, that <laughs> the integration part is hard. They'll do it if we ask them um, and they get good at it. And then it's, again, it's the ones, you know, the great two ball players, whether it's Kelly Clays or Katie Spieler in very different ways, are they're mm -hmm. both great at it. They, they've made it seamless. You know, so they practice it, but they know how to integrate it into games. And I think that's the surprise element always is the number one factor. I always give that talk at our camps because it came from like personal pain. You work on something all practice long, hour and a half, like 90 minutes, you know, and you're, you're repping this out. You just hit a bunch of cut shots, cut shots from here, cut shots from there. How do I deliver here? And then you say something like, okay, well, now we're going to play some queens. And then it, the joke is that like, yes, shackles are off. I don't have to hit any cut shots. It's like, no, no. <laughs> we just did that so that you can enter it into the game. Like the drills are there for a reason. They're there to have you insert them into competition. So don't just go and like, now it's game time. Now I'm free. Like we did this so that you can implement it, not so that it's somewhat better uh, when you need it. It's like establish a cut shot or, you know, if you're working on high lines or onto like establish it so that you feel confident in it right from the start. Yeah. That, I think that's just that that's a, that's a coaching dilemma that we, we certainly face. And again, sometimes I, I do bonus point scenarios on top of drills. So kind of leading certain drills and then we'll get in a queen or we'll get in something and we can bonus it so that at least we know we're good that they're going to use it you know it kind of like it, it forces their hand to do those, those directions and then again you take the shackles off and you kind of do what you do and a uh, video is obviously helpful and then there's always like the reverse learning like we play against a team i mentioned uh cal poly tia she, she's just good at it right so she burns us so now i'm forced as a coach to prep my players to defend it so it actually kind of it again is that there's the survival forces us to get better and not to say, well, we don't, we don't two ball. That's cheap. Like, yeah, you're going to lose like that a lot. So how can I not lose to someone who's two balling? And I find it to be cheap. Grand Canyon plays a certain style where they're constantly pushing it. Certain players in the NCA or Long Beach used to do it a little bit less now. Like, so they have certain signatures that they play. So part of it is book breaking out video and kind of creating game plans. So, okay, we might, we might shift our base. So sometimes it's, you know, we might like a center field base in some scenarios, but in other situations, we need more wing basing. You know, oh, we've got that's, uh, that's, I think that's important for people to hear. So yeah. you, you don't teach one specific style of defense. You say against certain players or certain teams or scenarios, we enter our defender into the middle versus we send them right to their diagonal yeah i like to go to the middle in the beginning i'm finding i mean i've kind of every year every couple of years i'm kind of continuing to move i listen to what todd's doing i watch different schools i think there's a little more dancing in the back than is necessary mm -hmm. i don't think the hitters can see it that much at mm -hmm. our level so i think there's a little more dancing than it's my favorite so you probably won't see us dance a lot so a little more central as like a ba kind of a center field base is like often where we'll get. But again, if someone's two balling in a certain direction, like if I have a right side player and she's not overhead twoing, so I might just come in and just kind of come in and just kind of center and then check the two and then come back 
you know, and then come back and then get to my spot or not. So I like to do things like that. Or it might just be a certain call early sure. show. You know, huh. it's like, look, block the angle. Let's early show the line. And then you're there for the two ball. Okay. You know, it's like an adaption. So you can do scenarios where you do early shows and you're there so that you also get the two ball. Um, and then maybe you kind of fake out to the angle and then you just stay in the line. So you've taken it away because you're just standing there. Um, so that might be after a timeout or something that we prep. It may okay. not be for the entirety of a duel, but in certain scenarios or some two ball hitters that are overhead, a lot of like left sides, you know, do they, they score to like area five, right? They go away, but then they want to cut back, but is their cutback really to area one or is their cutback down the middle? It's probably mm. down the middle, right? Yeah. They kind of don't really get there. That uh, coming from the reverse. There. So you kind of start to say, well, oh, but if it's blowing 20 mile an hour wind, well, then I got to get in a different spot. So like you kind of start to just give them a little bit of freedom on, hey, we got to go let's check the cutback, you know, or mm -hmm. don't don't overcheck the cutback because it ain't going to go as far as she thinks it's going to go. She's going to try and spin it back, but it's going to go to six. So you're like, OK, you just hover in six. You've got it there and then you can move. So uh, definitely something we're thinking about, again, versus certain opponents more than others. And yeah, we have baselines that we use and then just other things that we'll add in that we, that we okay. find to be useful to defend certain situations. That's, to me, that's adaptability, just trying to figure out how to be better on defense. Just a note, guys, for anyone who uh, is a little bit confused by what Evan just went through with uh, <laughs> zone one, six, and five. These are indoor zones. So if you're facing the net, if you want to rewind after you understand this and then play it again so you get kind of a cue, if you're facing the net, the back right of your court, of your court on your side of the net, that's one. The back middle of your court is six. The back left of your court is five. And the same thing, the reverse happens over there. So if I'm looking at a net on the other side, one, zone one is the far left corner. Zone six is the far middle and zone five is the far right. So if you guys want to, knowing that, knowing where those little numbers are, because it comes from indoor, if you want to rewind it and then hear and try to visualize what we're talking about, then uh, more than welcome. But just a little, sometimes <laughs> sometimes we go a little over the head and it's they don't all have indoor training. Yeah. Yeah, we got to do a better job. I got to do a better job, uh, I guess, pointing out the areas of the court right there. But yeah, I think. A lot of people in volleyball tend to know them, but yeah, I think the, increasingly though, you're seeing more and more different attacking zones set up. I think there's some really kind of John Mayer guys, Stanford, others uh, have really pushed that level. We're kind of getting into attacking zones and creating beach attacking zones um, along the net. And I think those are innovations and things that are you know helping to push the game forward. People are doing cool stuff. You know, a couple of things like back to your defense. I, I changed the way I, I taught defense, you know, as a younger coach, I guess, mid twenties, I was like, enter into the middle, be direct middle. Then after the set, or like once you know they're setting, then shift. Personally, I've gone completely away from that. I've gone, go to the position that you want them to see you in. You know, that doesn't have to be middle. You don't have to hide the position. It's just a position you want them to see you in or that you're going to get stable. And just pay attention as hard as you can. And I think most of the on to defensive answers can come from, <laughs> hey, you know, like, if you were to lose a million dollars, if this person puts it over on one, two, or three touches, what, how would you react for every <laughs> single ready. touch, right? Like somebody's like throwing like a, a glass ball that has, has a million dollars in it. And if it breaks on your side of the court, you don't get it. Like that type of mental intensity I find helps people more. They just get surprised because they expect three touches and that's that's when they lose but just the mindset of somebody is always attacking me with every single touch even after i hit it if i hit a cut shot and i think there's a chance that somebody might dig it i don't wait to see if they dug it i'm already sprinting back on defense you know i want to be waiting for them so that i can be reactive on defense but i think so many players they hit the shot they say, oh, they cut it or they they dug it and they try to check out the dig. And then they say, oh, well, the setter's kind of rushing. And then finally, like after the set, then they're trying to get back to defense. Yeah. And you're already at a huge disadvantage there. So I, I'm more like getting players to go, if you think you might get dug as soon as you contact the ball, 
get your butt back to your next defensive position, whether you're a blocker or a defender. Yeah, that's great advice, Mark. I mean, I like the million dollar analogy. (laughs) I wish someone would offer me a million. I would grab that thing. (laughs) So yeah, it reminds me of kind of a camp. Sorry, I'm out again on my lights here. I got like a camp analogy that I use sometimes. I have a camp analogy that I'll use as like a tiger in a jungle. You know, like you're going to go for your prey. So it's like that kind of that level of uh, pregnant hesitancy. Like you're jazzed on the Mm. edge of like doing something and that's i think i'm thinking when you're talking about defense at that level and those are again that goes back to habits right can we train those things in can those become habits to so because a tenacious defender is one who's always ready so can we train someone to come in and enter and be Mm. ready you know enter and be ready and then swing and then come back and be ready you know and then there are two and then be ready for the three how do you keep kind of being ready, being ready, those, there is actually some room, I think, to, to change those as habits. Do you think um, there'd be any value in you, you establishing a rule for University of Hawaii that if somebody ever throws a ball on your court during the point, you don't stop, you dig it. Like there's an outside just ball thrower, like a random one coming across yeah. the court or like an assistant coach who at any given time can just chuck a ball over, like teaching yeah. like, and then making a fun, like uh, push ups or burpees or something out of it. I have a fun one that I learned. You and I both share the, the New York history. So I mean, I can wrap here. Maybe someone that you know, one of the first club gyms that I ever used to go to was with a guy named Rick Cole. And Rick is an athletic director at all these places, huge volleyball guy. His son's actually playing at Pepperdine now, out uh, Trey. His daughter is at you know, Duke and just a great, great volleyball mind. Came from Long Island to Western New York, then back to Long Island. Coach yeah. Dowling, Stanford, all these places. And we, I went to his gym and it was a thing that he like to drop the ball. Dude, he goes, you know what that is? What's that? And he goes, that's a point. So there was no, like, it's this little JV, you know, kind of scenario, but anytime they hit the ball, hit the floor was a point. So no matter what drill, when we were shagging, so you're doing a, you know, a circle drill, you're doing a serve receive drill, you're doing a setting drill, whatever. Kids are constantly scrambling, like diving to grab the ball. I because love that. Ball hits the ground is a point. It doesn't matter where, that point, grab it, like a million dollar ball. Even when so, you're shagging, like, no, yeah, you don't, you don't throw it so you, it mentality. bounces, like, boom, point, shagging push mentality. ups, runs, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, ball hits the ground, everything stops, we're on the wall. Like, and then kids are running after to grab that ball because that's the point. So that I have, I don't, I haven't remembered that in a while, but maybe I'll have to bring back the old uh, right there, Long Island oh. Academy, and see if uh, see how the point goes. So that's, sometimes the Long said. Islanders is a little different than the Hawaiians. We got a little different pace out here, a little harder <laughs> to push that on it on each other. So my brother's uh, a lieutenant in the FDNY, um, and he just moved out to Hawaii, Oahu, and he's I think now just getting, you know, used to like a little bit slower and how small <laughs> the island is, and that everybody's a cousin of a cousin of somebody who you know so he's like you can't talk negatively about anybody because everybody is like so intertwined and and it's a very yeah. small like like kind of small high school drama in a way but he goes the whole the whole island is connected somehow as a family and right. he's learning how to slow down but also how to be i guess kinder than he needed to be in like the firehouse in new york and queens and brooklyn and bronx totally. you know yeah, a it's a little different. different. Yeah, good insights. And yeah, that's that's life on an island. We're all interconnected. So we know that and uh, it's fun. Hopefully I did a good job making a lot of people sound good out here today. <laughs> and I don't want to keep you too much longer. I, I do just want to uh, tackle, you know, we've got 15 other questions on the list that we, we haven't even touched. But I, what I do want to ask is, you know, as somebody who played in the 90s and then I think early 2000s, right? You had to learn a certain way and you were learning probably in New York where your best role model was maybe somebody around the neighborhood who also played open because there weren't coaches at that time. No coaches. And I think a lot of adults run into the no coach situation. That's where they're thankful for the stuff that we do because they're like, yes, somebody's reaching out to us and saying, this is how you play the game. So is there anything that you learned early as a player that you teach completely differently 
than you learned back then that was like wrong that you learned as a player or or just different because the game changed that now you teach and you're like man i i will never teach that to my players even though that's how i learned it yeah <laughs> i think a little bit we were talking about in the two ball stuff is a pretty good example of that you know whereas it was it wasn't really part of the game and sort of the way that we would do our preparation for two ball or just that it just wasn't something we had to pay attention to nearly as much mm. is a factor there things that i would want to unlearn i mean i didn't have coaches on the beach so there's i wish i would have learned how to have better attack timing and spacing <laughs> when i was learning yeah. you know i think the tendency to be early or the tendency to take kind of like weird angles it, it, that was you know for a smaller player getting under the ball a little bit was something that would just be a little more natural and people just adapt sometimes they play a little lower a little smaller yeah. on the east coast florida and everyone's kind of playing low I wish I had more sense of time and space. If you could remember how you played, I know it's it's not always easy. Like we didn't have easy film back then. But if you were to look at yourself as a player and give yourself some specific cues instead of like better timing or better spacing, what would you be telling your former self in terms of how to time it better or how to space yeah. it better? Yeah. We, we use pop. I use pop a little bit now in my coaching, which is point of preparation. Okay. So preparing to hit. You know, so like allowing myself to kind of, I think I would be also a little bit more creative in my attacking zones. Elvis helped me with that a little bit. He would pull me into the middle a little bit and I didn't really understand it, but I was playing with a really high level guy. So I just was able to, you know, this kind of like pass point of preparation. So either pass kind of like a, like, you know, drag in like a little bit of a lateral and forward. Cause I'm kind of small, so I won't have a 15 foot approach it might be 10. So how do I kind of pass, get to my spot, kind of get really kind of like a lot of potential energy and then take off or pass and then fly way out and then try and make my move from there. So more of that being really purposeful on where I'd want to start my approach from and to do it with really, really purposeful momentum. Because uh, again, it's a little just a tendency, I think, just to get a little little stuck in early and then just that feel kind of in and then, oh, shoot, now everything's behind me a little bit. So I'd say as if I went back and watched myself, I would do more preparation to attack and maybe more zonal attacking, you know, pass and then take that slot and pull it all the way around to the backside. It wasn't really part of the game when I played. So you would play. try to tell yourself to hit uh, per play, like on a different area of the net. Now we're along the net, you know. So again, as I evolved, I got more of a middle and a wide. But I think as I, if I were to go back, I would probably have evolved the back as well too, and I would have been a little bit more, a little less angular to my middle, and a little bit more pull in and then straight ahead. As a left side or a right side? As a right side. As a right side. Okay. Yeah, so as a right so side, right you would make that in, like that hard straight L in. straight shuffle, yeah. then go straighter in closer to an L more than like, kind of like the, like kind of like the X. And I think when, even when I went middle, it was still a little X that I'd get kind of turned. Whereas mm -hmm. I think what I've seen as a coach is, well, yeah, it's really important, especially California, like a lot of that side wind, it's just critical to be able to kind of get that feeling of l so that everything's in front of you and then if you want to go back to the wind you you're not like kind of like turned way out to do it you have a little more vision for the right sides do you teach uh, that right side should have that soft angle towards the middle i mean more now I'm, I'm trying to get some players to not a hard angle at all not not anything like the left side would come in but just a soft enough angle to where you're at least your toes face the back middle of the court so like a little 15 degree sliver instead of that straight on or sometimes players like go from the middle towards the antenna to swing they almost line up in a i formation but uh, do you teach a straight l or are you okay with your players sort of taking that soft angle into yeah the no hard and fast no hard and fast rules i think some some really it take to it and then are able to exercise it others it's a little less natural so i'm just happy to get them you know, a couple feet in. So again, I'm just teaching each person to kind of like what their sort of range is, what their passing accuracy is to like how, how consistent they can be with that point. So again, I, we, I call it pop. So it's pass pop, you know, it's like pass pop go, you know, but it's not pass go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where it all kind of happens at once. Just the feeling that there is sort of an, an area. Like three faces, pass, 
get to yeah. your spot, then it's an approach. It's not passing approach. Yeah. And I think for beginners or adults, that's something that they always are like, whoa, like, wow, I never really knew that. I didn't get that. So uh, to me, if I'm out there talking to like your A players or your B players that are in Hermosa that are coming to visit, I would be take a little time after, you know, you know, pass forward, you know, give yourself some time to get, you know, or be active to get to the best spot. And then deep breath. And then you can really kind of fire in all the steps of your approach to make it happen from there. I think those things would have been helpful for me as an attacker and probably would be really helpful for, you know, people that are learning. No one ever teaches, no one ever taught us. Right. <laughs> I had never had a beach volleyball coach in my whole life. And I've played for 25 years and I've played all over the country, all over the world. And there, I'd never had a coach. Um, so it's fun to do it. I and mean, it's fun that it's become a thing in the last like, 10 or 15 years because I, I don't think I really that wasn't part of the game in the 90s no one I mean, maybe no, the very very top five. yeah when it's funny because if there were coaches then they would have made a lot more money <laughs> yeah, <laughs> than yeah, today's so. coaches except for you know so, the guys everyone used to kind of try and keep it more in right it was a little mm -hmm. bit more insular of a culture right it was you know the kind of the haves and the have nots and so people understood things and they were obviously pointing each other in the right direction but I don't I think the, the game has gotten a lot more magnanimous it's gotten a lot more of a, a lot more giving it's just bigger you know it's yeah. global and then Americans I think really you know you had you know Dodd go to Italy to coach those guys you know they started seeing wow like our best guys went to Greece yeah. after. you know our best guys are getting sought after by these other countries how does that we're obviously in a pole position here we have the most understanding of the game so how can we start to use that as a resource to kind of like feed our own? And then obviously yeah. as the college and the club situation developed, that was coaching, you know, all of my guys I played against when I was a kid are all, not all of them, but a lot of them are coaching now. They coach in clubs, they coach in college. There's a lot of guys that have gone on. So it's I think funny, they have to like kind of go back to school. Like even if you were like crushing it, you're winning every open in Ohio or Florida, you realize, oh man. There's there's a technique to how I won. I just did a bunch of stuff naturally. Like I look at one of my best friends. Like uh, I'm I'm gonna knock him right now. But uh, Shane Donahue, who's with crushing things on the East Coast. But if you look at his design and how much trouble he puts himself into a lot, uh, he could be a ton more effective with a little bit of extra like offensive design and, and technique, and he wouldn't have to bail himself out with straight up crazy athleticism. Yeah. Which he does, but he's so athletic that he you know kind of has a unique style of, of, of how he plays that he probably wouldn't coach and he might not even know it, but he gets it done. So what do you, know? yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely different coming out of the playing mode, the playing mind into the coach's mode and the coach's mind. Mm. And I think you see it in other sports, NBA and, you know, and major leagues. It's not always just the purest best players that make the best coaches. You know, for me, I was, not, I played yeah. all the way up to the top. So I played against almost every great player in my generation I've played against in the U S. So I'm like, I played against everybody. So I've had an opportunity to play against people. And I did it for, as a little guy, it was like mm -hmm. doc rivers, you know, like Byron Scott, yeah. you know, yeah. Muggsy Bogues, yeah. all the little guys, Steve Kerr, you know, like all the coaches, <laughs> like the little guys, you know, they're going because they had to watch, you know, we had to learn that, you know, that's the other thing I think about not the way that I most learned the game when I didn't have a coach was watching mm. and I said, always wanted to beat that next guy, but also how can I learn? How can I see what Mark Beard's doing? How can I see what Shane Donnie's doing? How can I see what these guys are doing and be like, not only how can I beat it, but Ooh, how do I like want to like make that some of my, you know, part of my game. So I yeah. think it was sort of an emulation kind of feeling that um, wanted to kind of become more like certain players, what I saw them on TV or at pro events or whatever, not only wanting to beat them, which was highly competitive and motivating, but also wanting to get a little bit more like them also. Sure. So those, those were kind of like fed side by side to kind of kept my growth going. Yeah. And I, I always want to like hesitate with, with that advice. I think it's good advice, but I think we just filmed something for Instagram today where I said, you guys need to stop looking at Phil. You know, you need to stop looking at Sarah Pavin, at, at Alex Kleiman, <laughs> because you're not in the 1% of height. You know, so your selection will be different. If you're 5'5", five five, you check out Katie Spieler, you know, you check out Carissa, and you look for players that look and move similar to you instead of trying to select from... <laughs> 
players that like you would need significant amounts of surgery and robotics to get you <laughs> to, to, to move like them. And I want people to follow the best players and learn what they're doing well, but also don't try to do what somebody who is physically on a completely different page than you, you know, pick up something that you could use from their game, but know the things that you can't use from their game. Yeah, totally. Those are good insights, Mark. You're fine. I've never seen it go out so many times. Um, yeah, no, they're good insights. And I think it's realistic. You know, what you're pointing at is if you're dealing with athletes that are, you know, don't not big jumpers, how can they look in certain places? Maybe they are big jumpers, but they're undersized or they're super tall. And they, you know, they are certain things. Yeah. Maybe you need to watch, you know, Theo, you know, you go and pick some stuff up off of, you know, certain guys. So yeah, definitely finding people. And what's cool about the college game now is that there's just a lot more, people to watch you know yeah. there's the world tour there's just more people to watch you can find a lot more to actually do it whereas you know when we were growing up it you know it was on tv but you know, a little bit it's the very very top guys you know they're playing at the end so i think now there's so much video that's in the world video is a big difference you know for for coaching for scouting for recruiting for making development i think the the ability to tape yourself I and mean, we didn't video anything I barely have any video. I have one VHS <laughs> that has been nice. translated to a disc playing Bland and Fanoy, like in Belmar, you know, it's all chalky and That's it's awesome. like one video. It's like, great. I can get that to, you know, like, got that, yeah. it was like one barely pictures at all. You know, it's like, it just was a different era. Whereas mm -hmm. every, every athlete now that I, you know, that I see, you know, I get a hundred emails, you know, in a week from athletes that have YouTube channels and Vimeos and highlights and full matches. And they've got everything set up and they're like 14 years old from Texas. You're like, wow. Crazy. So it's just way more footage now. So lots get lost in there, but I think it's definitely a great tool for people to use to, to not only look at themselves, but look at others and slow things down and, and see how they can you know, make improvements and adjustments to their dance. Okay. I, so I get just, I promise, Two more questions. I know it's been, I know it's been a minute, but it's a good conversation. We haven't stopped, you know, with that recruitment. Is there something that parents or coaches are doing wrong or just wasting their time on when it comes to contacting a coach or showing them videos or creating an Instagram account? Like, is it right for them to just send you an Instagram link of all their highlights or a YouTube video? Or should they send a popcorn when they send you a DVD or a USB? Like, what's the best way for somebody to get yeah. your attention as coach? And what's the wrong way? Yeah, you know, it, it got to be respectful of our, it, it, it's catchy, right? Because they know that we don't have a ton of time, right? So long winded, like drafts can be, you know, like a lot of storytelling can be kind of hard to follow. Even if it's like poignant and sweet, like it can be a little bit much. So uh, if I'm talking to recruits, brevity matters. I think brevity and video can be useful also. You don't, I don't need 20 videos. Give me a highlight and then a link that I can watch games if I want. You know, like, okay. so kind of like that, if I'm more interested in there. Should it be on, uh, on Instagram? Should it be on YouTube? Should it be on a drive, a Google uh, Drive? Like, is there something that's... YouTube is easy. You know, what, sometimes they have scenarios where they have to down... If you want to make it as, you know, you're, you run a podcast, you want to make it as user-friendly as possible. So it, it really, the coach is the user at that point. So you want to make something that's going to translate as easily as possible for the coach. It's in my inbox, I press a link. I don't have to download it. I don't have to store it. I don't want to do any of that. Open my Dropbox folder and no then Dropbox. reinitiate my yeah. uh, no Dropbox. Um, huh. so okay, ease is important there. Again, there's as you get further into it. As much as I say the long winded is annoying, but some I've read amazing stories. I love to hear the stories. I just kind of depends on like time and place. The mm -hmm. more that they can be aware of where we're at in our schedule. We're competing. Hey, great game the other day versus UCLA. I'm sure you guys are, you know, tired on the road. Just want to give you a quick check in. Here's my highlights. Have a great day. Gone. Not, oh, here's this greatest story about me that's ever happened. And it's an hour after we just lost that match. I don't want to see it. Like it, hmm. it's just not the right thing at the right time. And that takes and a And then lot it's gonna fall down that inbox to it never gets seen. With this huge scenario that is tone deaf 
to what is actually real for me. So a little bit of environmental awareness, what's my schedule, who are we playing, is it off season, where I'm gonna go recruit or coach. Like usually when they do those little things, it's a little, okay, like they're, they're paying attention to what's going on. I'm not like one, you just copied and pasted 20 different bulk emails, a beautiful letter, but you sent it to 20 coaches, mm. we can tell. You know, so a little bit of nuance directly to the program, user friendliness on video, and then, yeah, it's a fine line between being consistent and being kind of annoying. You don't feel like I got to get back to this kid just to tell them to stop. I'm out. Like, you know, it's like usually I like to kind of you know, just kind of slow motion look through things. And because a lot of them are years and years in advance. I get wow. emails from 25s and 26s. Tw- you know, they're young. So I can't do anything with it. It's just, okay, it's in my file of 25s. I know when I see X coach on the beach, I say, okay, yeah, well, I got on my watch list. And it's real basic. As we get closer into the recruiting time, you know, the 24s of the last six months, okay, like, you know, we're getting ready. So we really start to kind of contour lists, like kind of fragment people, see where they're at and, you know, how, who they might help us. And then, then we open into communication back and forth. So well, with, uh, without you know, with being able to keep it brief with the the email or the link, which I think, yes, brilliant. I love when they get to the point quickly, and I'm more likely to actually look at that email. If you send me a page, I like as soon as I open like a DM and I see four paragraphs, I'm like, <laughs> I'll open that later, and then I never open it. You know, but how is there any way? other than that for an athlete or somebody to just stand out. Like it literally in my era, I was in college and I sent a bag of popcorn with my DVD, you know, just like yeah. something, whatever, like, <laughs> like a Sour Patch Kids or something. But now it would be kind of a headache for somebody to like ship stuff out. I don't know. Or yeah. maybe that would make them stand out more. But I've gotten letters like, before. I've gotten some really heartfelt letters before and those are sweet. I can't say that I've recruited those kids necessarily. Like it wasn't distinguished, but it definitely like, uh, they're more likely to get a response okay. you know, when I'm able to, they're going to be treated in that way. I can't, we can't get back to every athlete that shows interest. It's just not really practical anymore. There's so many. So they're more likely to get a response when they've gone out of their way. So, oh, thank you for the lovely letter and the thing they can't, you don't want to get like bought, you know, you know, like trying to get like stuff. That doesn't really like work. It's like outside the rules almost. So, you know, but a letter can be cool. But again, well-placed, well-timed, regular communication that is uh, courteous, respectful, and aware of what the coaches, what someone's best guess and what might be real. Oh, thanks. Good luck. You're having a good season. Good luck on the upcoming matches. So a little bit of something that contours that they're following, that they're interested in what our story is also. Instagram is cool. I, again, I'm not personally doing a ton there and that sometimes I have my assistant coaches go down those roads because you want, it's a good way to inventory what's going on. Keep your Instagram clean, you know, like it's available. You're following our stuff, right? So you're going to yep. follow UH Beach Volleyball, but then you're going to post on your thing that you're out drinking with your buddies. High school party, it's not yeah. going to like, pro, like prove good. So just know that your profiles are very much public um, and that we will spend time, you know, in taking a glance you don't want to have that kind of double personality so that's just kind of pitfalls to avoid certainly because i've seen things on instagrams that i'm like oh whoa like wait a second this is a different kid that's emailing me so at least gets it doesn't like end the deal but it certainly gets me to think more or ask more questions so they should they should certainly be uh aware of what their public profiles look like and leave them public so is a once a month tag like a like is that too much like once every two months like that soft little less than a paragraph email because i know my wife's a, a stunt woman and part of their job as a stunt woman to get jobs is they have to keep constant contact with stunt coordinators so that you're just kind of always present of mind when a job might show up so part of her process is like finding the stunt coordinators that she loves wants to work for and shooting those people an email to say like, Hey, saw this movie, the action sequence was sick. And just like you said, you know, she's looking for things to know that they appreciate and love about that coordinator and how they would be open to work if they have it, but that's part of the process. So is it a once a month thing, a once a two month, is there a right timing? And I know that the timing is important, but is there me, I would say like no way more than once a month. 
Yeah, not more than once a month, you know, definitely not more than once a month. It could be seasonal, you know, there's always like, there. it might be different centers. Hey, what's this latest with camps? Hey, you know, I noticed you guys did that really cool trip in the fall. That was awesome. I'm going to come see you. Season, then we're getting closer to June 15th because they know that we're going to be able to respond to them. That might be like, hey, I know I reached out a couple weeks. Just really wanted to let you know, like you kind of like put like an exclamation point on like a series of communications. So yeah, I would say not more than monthly unless there was, unless there's a dialogue. If there's dialogue back and forth and just answering questions, providing information, asking questions, you know, that's the big thing is that I always try to encourage recruits to, hey, you have power, you have leverage, it's all yours now. Because that mm-hmm. changes when you sign or you do these other things, your leverage is going to shift. So be confident, ask questions. I want athletes that are gonna, that are gonna ask me hard questions because I know they're thinking I'm mean, not just trying to yes, 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 their way in the door. So I think it's important for them to be, you know, confident and express their, you know, respectfully, just, you know, ask good questions and those things engage dialogue and find personal ways to connect. Those, it's all relationship management it does come down to a little bit of who they know, um, if they know other coaches and things like that. So that's just kind of for them to, to, you know, kind of work through. Sure. Okay. Final, final, final question. You talked about TCU and Long Beach having a certain style that they play. And I'm actually uh, talking to Mike tomorrow, tomorrow or, or next week. I got him on my calendar, so it should be fun. But are there any clubs... You don't have to name them, but do you look at clubs and say, I know what product that club turns out. So if I'm looking for this type of player, I'm going to look to that club first. Do you look at clubs as as a company that turns out specific products that you would be interested in? Or do you look at, doesn't matter what club, whatever, I'm just going to select from the entire country's pool of athletes? Yes. Yes, there are products that are developed out of certain clubs. Again, is you know, and some of them I've mentioned, you know, part of it's geography, you know, there's just pure geography involved. If a club is from, you know, Manhattan beach, it's pulling in a certain level of train ors and also a certain environment of athletes going to get the high level beach IQ players out of this club. That's coming from the California beach. Then there's different, you know, I mean, there's, yeah, I could easily name two clubs, but I think I won't and just say, yeah, that there's certainly clubs. And again, it's relationship management. And if a club changes hands or if a certain director is not involved as much, the product there might change or the relationship there might change. But so I, I pride myself really on savoring and connecting those relationships. I'm going to be in California next week. I'm going to practices. Um, so the good thing is just go to practices and just, you know, cause they're people I know and that I trust and I want to go and look, I have one or two athletes I want to see, but I want to see your 26s. And so we develop a longer standing kind of conversation there. So it's not to say that if you're not at a top club with a top reputation and a top coach that knows the coach at Hawaii that you can't get recruited. We still very much have our eyes open to the best athletes, to the highest character kids. Those are going to kind of show up from all over, but there's some tried and true that we can go through, whether it's in California, Arizona, Florida. For us, it's geography a little bit too. Is It's cheaper to come from the West Coast than it is to come from Texas. So, But I do go to Texas and there's great clubs there. So I just know I got to have a, it's almost like an international athlete if they're coming from Texas. I've got to feel that be more, you know, have more scholarship money or they're more of like a walk on route. And is it really worth it for them to want to do that? So they they tend to be kind of higher nuts if they're coming from further because there's just more that goes into it. Mm. But yeah, those relationships as college coaches really matter. And yeah, we can certainly trust the coaches. You know, a lot of the coaches that are running clubs. I mean, Jacob's got a, Jake Gibbs got a club. The Dodds have a club. Fanoy and Holly have clubs. I mean, they're going to get trained at a certain level. You know yep. what's coming to a degree. It doesn't mean that all their athletes are <laughs> by any means are going to qualify at that level. But you know what but they're told and, you, they're and you've experienced it with athletes before. So you, you just say like, hey, they have this knowledge base because this gets filtered down to all of their coaches and all their athletes. I think club directors miss on that, that they form a club and they let coaches do what they want. And then, you know, they can't go to to a college coach and say, you know how the last one turned out. Well, it's because of this process, not because of of whatever. I I just think, I, I think more club directors should focus on what product are they turning out? How does the process create that product? And it's not just getting more coaches, getting more courts. It's what's teaching, what teaching system yeah. are you utilizing and what yeah. culture do you create? I think each is still small enough too, that it's the 
coaches are pretty involved with what's going on. You know, it's, they're just more involved with what's going on. You get in the indoor club and there's 40 teams or something. So it's kind of easier to kind of dilute. Whereas on beach there, you know, there's 20 kids, there's 40 kids, there's 30 kids, coaches there all the time. So there's a little bit of a sense of, you know, if it, if it's these clubs that I'm talking about, if it's Patty Dodd, if it's Matt Olson, if it's Dan Styles, there's people that I know and trust. I've worked with them for 10 years. I know they're great coaches. I know how they do what they're doing. I, I can trust them in our conversation when they're talking about their athletes. And I can also trust that their athletes are going to have certain things checked off um, that may be interesting for us too. So again, it's for us, it's also similarly around kind of cultivating those relationships and, and mm. keeping uh, keeping up to date and in touch and, you know, and just using, using the leverage of those relationships to just, you know, try and create opportunities for athletes. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> They're getting really good these days. So uh, it's making it harder and harder for us to sift through and find the very best because there's, there's a lot of good ones. Man, Evan, this was a great talk. Uh, I could keep going because there's so much <laughs> more, but maybe we could just push it to another time and, and get you on again and then get through the, uh, <laughs> the second 80% of our, <laughs> of our list. but yeah, I, I appreciate your time so much and your insight, super unique insight as a player who's come up and then like the transition from mainland to Hawaii and all of the success of your school and your teams and your programs. And then definitely how clear you are on all of your knowledge what you need what you want and where you're headed it's uh it's a it's a pleasure to see somebody who's got direction you know cool. Thanks. So, yeah really thank you so much for your time and it, it do you have anything any last words or any last no. standing advice or just uh, goodbyes or places to follow you or anything yeah uh so yeah and thanks for having me on i had heard a little bit about the podcast i got to hear a bunch on the way in you guys are doing a great job i've always seen your volleyball camps and i think that's neat i love that you're reaching out to adults i think you've kind of created a really neat niche mm -hmm. on that side to kind of keep people growing i'm happy to see new york people in volleyball um and having success in hermosa it's not easy out there as you know so i think you put a really really good footprint so i'm happy to support you and find some time in the future to come you know kind of hopefully have this conversation again you know in six months or next year and then over the years as you guys grow up um i'm, ha I'm happy to build a relationship you and so yeah it's stoked hopefully some people listen hopefully some people benefit it I'm around, I'm not so much on the social medias anymore, but obviously UH Beach Volleyball is our team's one. Um, that's where my focus is primarily on Instagram. You can find me personally, Evan Todd 1013. I'm on LinkedIn with my name. So if folks want to find me there or just email me, you can find me at Hawaii Athletics is uh, Evan Silb at hawaii.edu. Happy to always field emails, just continue to grow the sport. It's, we have an amazing, amazing sport and the growth is awesome. And it's only coming up from now. So it's pretty neat to see what the last 10 years have given us and what's the next 10 years going to give. And then beyond that, I think with uh, so many great people involved, it's uh, sky's the limit for beach volleyball. So it's fun to be kind of taking care of my little part of the world out here in Hawaii. Doesn't get doesn't get much better than this. So. <laughs> I saw a couple of your uh, pictures on Instagram. It just looks like you live the life, man. The Every life. picture is a nice sunset or a beach. So <laughs> we do. love it. Cool, man. Well, thanks for having me on, Mark. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Evan. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, right, guys. Go Bows. See ya. Guys, cool, cool, cool interview. Loved talking. Loved how, yeah. you, you know when some people are so just clear? They're clear. They know what they're talking about. They know where they're going, and they know what works and doesn't work. And like Evan absolutely presented that, and it was – it's really a pleasure when, when I, I don't know how to, how to say it other than the clarity uh, that he had. And he's at the helm of one of the most prestigious programs in the country, if not the world. And I think they're in really good hands. So pretty fantastic. Just a couple of announcements. We're, we're starting this. And a lot of you listening might know about our complete player program online. And we are actually starting a Better at Beach coaching certification. So if that is something that you're interested in, we have courses, we have extensive courses in how to learn and how to teach the game. And if you are at all in any way interested in uh, taking a Better at Beach coaching certification, we will be starting that in the coming months and we'll be running some coaching specific clinics. If you 
ever want to do that, just go ahead and visit our homepage. We have a link tree. Just click under the coaches tab and it'll take you through a few questions that get answered and you will end up in the right place to know where you should be in, in terms of getting one of the coaching clinics or doing our online coaching certification uh, so that we can help more players uh, and more coaches have better tools to be able to, you know, move the sport forward and share the game in a good way and, and hopefully one day get some younger players uh, under the watchful eye of Evan. Get in touch, visit our website, and you know where we are. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Pleasure talking with Evan. Reach out to him if you want some advice. And, of course, you know we're always welcome. Thank you. Have a great day, and we'll see you on the sand.